I just want you to just, um, just focus on the need for Jesus this morning. All I need is you. All I need is you. All I need is you, Lord. Is you, Lord. All I need is you. All I need is you. Lord, all we need is you. We've come here to worship and praise you this morning, Lord. Let's get our Jesus on, church. Let's worship him. Glorious day. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind? away it was my tomb till I met you I was breathing but not alive all my failures I tried to hide it was my tomb till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name. To your glorious day. Now your mercy saved my soul. Now your freedom is all oh, I know. The old man knew. Jesus, when I met you, 
you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, but you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. When you call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Woo! Amen, amen. Who heard Jesus call their name? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. Your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, holy. All creation cry, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever. Hallelujah. If you've been forgiven, and if you've been redeemed, sing the song to the land And if you walk in freedom And if you bear his name Sing the song forever to the land We'll sing the song forever and amen And the angels cry Holy all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever. Hear your people. 
Jesus, there is no other. Jesus, there is no other. Your word will never change. Your name is here to stay. Jesus, there is no other. Jesus, there is no other. You are the one true King, Lord over everything. Jesus, there is no other. Jesus, there is no other. Your word will never change. Your name is here to stay. Jesus, there is no other. Jesus, there is no other. The mighty light of Judah, the pure and spotless lamb, the Alpha and Omega, the good and great I am, the God that saves the nations, the one they bow before. Let every voice sing out, who is like, who is like the Lord?
We're the sons and the daughters. Let us sing our freedom. up our study, the two E's. And uh, if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you know that the two E's stand for uh, excessive and exponential. This is who our God is. He's an excessive and exponential God. And we've learned that God wants so much more for us, but it's us that keeps God limited on what he can do. And it mostly it revolves around our mindset. And so today, of course, I'm going to start out with a question. And the question is this. What if you knew then what you know now? Think about that. What if you knew then what you know now? For instance, in 1980, when Apple went public, would you have invested into it? A $5,000 investment in 1980 would roughly bring you a little over $2 million right now. I don't know about you, but I could sure use a $2 million uh, increase in, in living. Um, would you eat differently, right? Would you, would you eat two or three chicken fried steaks a week and tons of hamburgers and all the chocolate in the world and milkshakes and ice cream and stuff? Or would you, would you eat differently? Because we've learned that nutrition is it's a big deal, right? 
Would you undo a hairstyle or a, a, a clothing style, right? Like go back and not have a mullet or, you know, uh, not be wearing the pink, you know, shirt with the white blazer. I mean, you know, we thought that was so cool back then. But looking back, I'm going like, yeah, gee whiz, I don't know about that one. I don't know. Anyways. They say hindsight is 2020. But I'm here to tell you that with God's word, the future is just as clear as the past. God is not a God who's sitting up there and wanting to withhold things from us and have us just fumbling around in life. God has a clear and cut plan for us. And as much as we can look at the past and say, gosh, I wish I would have done it differently, we can look at God's word and say, man, I know I need to do it differently. Because here's the bottom line. God, as I said, is excessive and exponential. He's exceedingly abundant, right? Didn't Jesus say that he came to give life more abundantly? In week one, I mentioned that one of the reasons we don't experience the excessive and exponential life is that most of us think in addition when God thinks in terms of multiplication. But I want to add one more thought to this. We often miss living an excessive and exponential life because we are consumed by the temporary rather than focused on the internal. I'm going to say that again. We are consumed by the temporary rather than focused on the eternal. We're so consumed with this world. We're so consumed with our comfort. We're so consumed with us, with me. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things below. Oh, no, he said above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Paul's telling the Colossian church that, look, your eyes are not where they need to be. And in fact, Jesus knew that this would be an issue for many of us. And so he taught an incredible parable to help us understand why the internal investment and focus are so critical. In our time today, in my time with you today, I'm going to ask you two major questions that could redirect the course of your life. I'm telling you right now, if you grasp what God is telling you today, it is going to change your life dramatically. Instead of living in the world of addition, church, we can move into the kingdom of multiplication. The title of today's message is The Two E's Reward. Would you please stand if you can as we read the Word of God? We've got a lot to cover this morning. Matthew 25, 1 says, At the time the kingdom of heaven, at that time the kingdom of heaven will be like. So what I want you to understand is as we're reading these passages of Scripture here, that it's telling us what the kingdom of heaven will be like when it comes here on earth. This is what we can expect. Starting in verse 14 of Matthew 25, it reads, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who has called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of the servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. 
His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not gathered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For, who, for whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Lord, help us to understand that we're just not talking about money here. We're talking about a thought process. We're talking about lifestyle. We're talking about what re reflects your glory in our lives. Help us, Holy Spirit, to understand in Jesus' name. All the church said, please be seated. So in all that we read there, the aha moment for me was verse 1. Verse 1. When I read verse 1 to you, it said, the kingdom of heaven will be like the, ke ke yeah, the kingdom of heaven will be like, like, listen, here's what you understand with that verse. God is giving us insider information. When he says that, he's now going to give us inside information on what the kingdom of heaven looks like. Remember the question that we started with, if you only knew then what you know now. Church, here's a news flash. In this parable, God giving you in, is God is giving you in advance the blueprint on how your life on earth exponentially impacts eternity. He's allowing you to know what you will know in the future. That's what he's doing. He's saying, look, I'm giving you a glimpse of what the future is looks like. I'm giving this glimpse. And so we need to be living with the internal focus. And what is the internal focus? Jesus taught it. And here's what it is. God owns everything. He doesn't own some of it. He doesn't own part of it. He owns all of it. He owns everything. Here's our problem. We think we own it. I've earned this. I've said that myself many times. I worked hard for this. I saved for this. Because I act like it's all mine. Matthew tells us something key in all of this about God's mindset. And here's what it is, and it's in verse 14. It says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Did you catch that? God's mindset, church, is to entrust what he has to us. The problem is when we believe that what he's given us and everything that we have is ours. And what happens is it's almost impossible for us to let it go because we act like it's ours. I'll tell you this. It's easy, though. It's easy to let go, right? And it's easy to give up what never belonged to you in the first place. Right? If it didn't belong to you, it's easy to give it up. I believe that the primary reason God has called us to honor him with our first fruits 
with the tithe is because the tithe is a, de- is a declaration of God's ownership. When we honor God first, it's a declaration that we believe God owns everything. The problem is, is that most people honor God last. They're going to pay Uncle Sam, PG&E. They're going to pay everybody else first. And then if there's anything left, well, here, God, this is yours. And I'm telling you, people that struggle with money typically do not honor God first. You have money problems because you don't honor the Lord. I know that firsthand. I had money problems because I did not honor God. It's a spiritual principle, church. Leviticus 27.30 says this, One-tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to him as holy. It's a principle, church. Now, I'm not teaching this because we need money, and I'm not asking you to give money. What I'm telling you is that there's a principle that needs to be at work in your lives so that you can understand how to tap into what God has for you. Listen, every time we get paid, we have the opportunity to remind ourselves who the owner and provider really is. And some of you this morning need to be set free from the burdensome idea that what you have is yours because that idea brings weight and bondage in your life. And here's the key. The tithe is the bridge to freedom. It's the bridge to freedom. Because, see, if you're anything like me, I struggled with materialism and possessions for, for half of my adult life. I was so poor, and a kid... Growing up without a family and trying to survive on the streets and going from house to house and everywhere else I could go to try to live, I said I was never going to be poor. That's what I said. And I chased money so hard that it was my God. And I'm telling you, I would chase one dollar because I said I might need that dollar someday. And I struggled with it, church. I struggled with it. And then I got challenged. I became a Christian. And I got challenged. And I got challenged with a verse in the Bible. And it's Romans eleven thirty six, 36. And it says this. From, for from him and through him and for him all things to him be the glory forever. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? I mean, what, you know, I'm a young Christian. What does that mean? Well, God had to show me what it meant. He had to take me through some rough times. I've shared with you in the past how we lost our house. Had been a Christian about three years, four years maybe. We went through a rough time. I was going through some some job stuff. And and I used to always say, as long as I have my house, I'm going to be okay. As long as I have a roof over my head, I'm going to be all right. I can live without PG&E. I can live without all these other things. But as long as I got a roof over my house to keep me out of the elements, I'm going to be fine. And then one day the sheriff's department showed up at 6 o'clock in the morning and put an eviction notice on my door and walked my family and I out of my house. God says, now do you get it? As long as you have me, you're okay. Not your house. Not your money. As long as you have me, you're going to be okay. And that was a life-changing lesson for me. And I hope none of you have to experience that. There's nothing worse than having to take your family and not know where you're going to live. But it changed my perspective on things. So let me ask you a question. How would your life change knowing that everything belongs to God? How would your life change? Because in this story, Jesus is describing the kingdom of heaven and is teaching us two things. Two things you need to grasp this morning. Number one, God owns everything. And number two, you will give an account. You will give an account. For what? What am I going to give an account for, Pastor? For what you did with what God gave you. See, when you weren't one of his, 
He couldn't hold you accountable. But now because you belong to Jesus, he'll hold you accountable. Matthew 25, 19 said, After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. God is going to settle his account with you and I. Now, for some of you, your theological alarms are going off, going, Hey, wait a minute. The idea that I'm going to be judged feels contradictory to what I believe or what I've been told. Doesn't the Bible say that we're saved through grace and not works? Yes, it does. It does say that. Don't we believe that Jesus endured judgment and wrath on the cross for us? Yes, yes, we believe that. Doesn't the Bible say there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? Yes, it does. Yet, the Bible clearly tells us that we will stand before God's judgment seat and give an account for what we have done and not done. Sorry, grace Our faith without works is dead. You better get that in your head. Romans 14.10 says this. Remember, we we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. All of us. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Sorry, don't mean to bust your bubble, but you're going to give an account to God. That doesn't Listen, when you, get, when you come into a relationship with Jesus, yes, you get your fire insurance, okay? Right? You get your fire insurance, but it's more than that. It's really more than that. And our actions will show whether we really have a relationship with Jesus. A lot of people say a lot of things. Right? That doesn't mean they're that. There's a bunch of 49er fans in here this morning. But you're not a 49er football player. You're a fan. Just makes you a fan. You're not on the team. We're on Team Jesus. Because we're on Team Jesus, we have to act and play like we're on Team Jesus. Paul is writing to Christians in Rome. He's not writing to, he's not writing to, to, he's writing to Christians in Rome. You need to understand that. And he's telling them, you are going to give a personal account to God. Church, I want you to understand this. You are going to stand before the creator of heaven and earth and this universe, and you're going to stand before him. And you are going to give an account for what you did, what you said about people, how you hated people, how you spoke bad about people. Right? The thoughts that you had? Church, if we would understand this principle, this it's not even a principle, it's a truth that we're going to stand before the Lord. And man, I know it's not going to be a good day for me. Because I know the things I've said. I know the things I've thought. I know the things that I've done. And yes, I'm saved by grace. But even as a Christian, I haven't done things right. We're going to be sitting or standing, more than likely standing, before the judgment seat of God. Now, here's what you need to understand. When we hear judgment seat, we think the worst in terms. Because to be judged is uncomfortable, right? It's an uncomfortable thing. But the reality of life is that we're going to give this account for all that we do. But here's what I want you to understand about God. God's not, he's not sitting up there on his throne going, oh, I cannot wait for so-and-so to get here. Boy, am I going to let them have it. Ooh, man, oh, I'm going to light them up like a Christmas tree. Boy, I'm going to blast on the screens everything they've done. Boy, you think social media is bad on earth. Wait till I get a hold of them, right? Church, it's not like that. You need to understand that God is cheering you on this morning. That's who our God is. He's cheering us on. He doesn't want us to fail. He wants us to succeed. And he's sitting at the edge of his throne, planning and preparing for how to bless you in your faithfulness. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, he said, Look, I am coming soon. 
My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. So again, how would your life change knowing you will give an account to God for what you do? See, when I realized that everything I have belongs to God, when that realization finally hit me, when, when I realized that I was going to give an account for what I have done with what he has given me, it became extremely obvious that God is passionate, that I was a faithful steward of what he had entrusted to me. And it's the same for you. God is passionate that we are faithful stewards of what he has entrusted us. And so there has to be this shifting in our thinking. We have to see ourselves differently. To become a faithful steward, church, we see ourselves as kingdom investors rather than earthly spenders. Did you catch what I said? We need to change our thinking from being earthly spenders to kingdom investors. Why do I say that? Because Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 tells us something. Do not store for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Church, every second of every day, we have the choice to spend what we have or invest what is given. And now I'm not talking about money. And so ask yourself, are you a spender or an investor? Well, what's the difference? Well, let me tell you. The definition of spend is to use or pay out, like in trading something, right? It's just exchanging whatever it is. That's spending. The definition of invest is to devote or pour into something expecting an exponential return. For example... Do you spend time with Netflix or do you invest time into someone who's hurting? Right? Because there's going to be an investment. When you pour into someone who's hurting, there's going to be an investment. There's going to be a return. Why? Because that person is going to get healed. Do you spend time and energy trying to control your kid's behavior? Stop it, stop it, stop it, blah, 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 blah. Or are on you on our Or are you on your knees praying for real with Jesus about your kids? Right? Because I'm going to tell you something. When your kids are out of your sight, you ain't got no idea what they're doing. They know how to act at home. Oh, they're so angelic. Yeah. No, you need to be praying for your kids, man, and really praying for them. Do you spend money on that bigger TV or newer car? Oh, I got to have a new TV. I just bought it one year ago or two years ago, but now they got this super cool TV. You, you ever got, you guys check out the price of TVs, man? I'm not even kidding you. There was a TV on Amazon that was $80,000. Go to Amazon and pull it up. I'm not even kidding you. An $80,000 TV, and it wasn't like as big as this wall or anything. I'm like, 80 grand? To just watch $80,000? Holy moly. Or I got to get that new car, man, you know. Car I got is good, but man, I need that new car because it drives by itself, you know, whatever it is. Right? Or do you take that money that you would spend on the, new, on the TV or the new car and, and take it and pour it into a ministry, Do you know there's so many ministries out there that you could be supporting and making a difference? Voice of the Martyrs, right? I mean, my gosh, there's a ministry right there where they're they're trying to save Christians' lives all over the world and spread the gospel at the same time. There's a worthy ministry. Church, when we become spiritual investors... Spiritual investors. It changes us and exponentially grows heaven. 
And I'm not talking about your money. I just talked about things that were time and energy. Netflix, praying for your kids. That's not money. Well, Netflix can be money, and it's not that much. But I'm saying, but, but praying for your kids, for your family. Do you want things to really change? Then pray. Ask God to intervene, but have him start with you first. Typically, i got to change first before anything else around me is going to change. we got to become kingdom investors. Now, I want you to peep something out here as I'm getting ready to close. My son went on a missionary trip down to Mexico when he was in sixth grade. So we gave him some money and stuff, and we told him, he said, hey, when you get down there, you're going to be able to take those American dollars and exchange it for pesos. And you're probably going to get a lot of pesos because the exchange rate was, was not favorable for the peso. And it was favorable for the dollar. He was all excited, man. So he goes down there and he, he exchanges his pesos. And I said, now remember to exchange it back before you come home. Right? Well, of course he doesn't. So he comes home. He's got all these pesos and stuff. He's all excited. Slams them on the table. He goes, look, Pop, look at all the money I got, man. Look at all the money I got. Look at all these pesos I got. Man, I'm going to go down to Walmart and buy this and buy that. And I said, son, they're worth nothing here in the United States. They're worth nothing. You think what you have in that plastic bag, you had like a baggie. I said, you think that's worth something? It's worth nothing here, son. Why? Because currency is only worth something in the country of its origin. It's worthless anywhere else. Right? It's worthless. Church, how many of us this morning are so enamored with the things of the world that when we get to heaven and discover that what we have spent or accumulated is simply worthless there, what is going to happen to your mind and your heart? That 80-inch 4K TV that you just went and dropped two $2,500 or $3,000 on is worth nothing in heaven. Yet, you will see colors in heaven that your human eyes can't even perceive. That 401k balance you're so worried about is worth nothing in heaven. You can't roll it over for Prada shoes in heaven. I'm sorry, it ain't going to happen, man. That iPhone 14 and that 15 is getting ready to come out, and you're just so anxious to drop all that money on it and everything else. There's no cell service in heaven. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's no cell service in heaven. Church, it's so crazy. I got my heart checked so hard with this study, it just it messed me up, man. So what do we do? Right? What have we learned? What do we know this morning? Has anything changed? We know that God is an exponential rewarder and that his rewards last forever. That it, it's, it, everything is eternal with God. So what do we do with what we know now? Remembering my opening question. If you knew then what you know now, how would you live life differently? Well, one thing's for sure is that I want to do and live life how God wants me to do and live life. And here's the clincher for you this morning. God wants us to live a life with an eternal perspective. See, that's the key. We've got to get out of this temporary. Because I'm telling you right now, you could walk out this door this morning and hit the parking lot and be dead. That's reality, man. And all the stuff you've been chasing and all the stuff you've been worried about and all the stuff that you've been getting caught up in, what did it matter? You're dead. You're gone. His body, boom, hits the ground, into the dust. We need to have an eternal perspective in life. And I don't know about you, but there's times when I try to imagine myself in the presence of God forever, what that's going to be like. Can you imagine no more pain? Right? No more pain? I mean, I can't imagine what that's going to be like. 
not having to wake up in the morning and, and take me hours to get moving. I don't, I don't complain about my stuff, but my whole right side of my body has been broken and shattered. It's life. It's what it is. But can you imagine no more pain? Can you imagine no more tears? I don't know about you. I cried a lot of tears this week. I had some real weird stuff going on. No more sin. No more sinful thoughts. No more sinful actions. Wow. No more brokenness. Wouldn't it be so cool to be completely healed and whole? That's what being in the presence of God is going to be like. And with that in mind, church, knowing where I'll be forever, I want to try to imagine what I will know then. Catch this and apply it now. Apply it now. Church, in closing, you are all ten talent people. You're the one with the ten talents. You've been, ta- you've been planted in a ten talent community of faith. You've been planted in a community of faith. You've been placed in a ten talent era of history. I've never seen the things that we've seen over the last 20 years. Like I never believed I, I would ever see it. I used to be a kid and watch Star Trek and think, wow, beat me up, Scotty, you know, right? Well, you can do that literally with your phone. You can call anybody, anybody in the world. Because church, eternity matters. It matters. It's where you are going to spend the rest of your existence, if you belong to Jesus, it's in eternity. It's in eternity. And because what we invest exponentially impacts eternity, because God's exponential reward lasts forever, there's only one takeaway from this this morning, is that we will hold nothing back. How could there be any other response in our lives? There can't be. Your time, your talents, your treasure, it all belongs to God. It belongs to God. It's not yours. Whatever talent you have, be humble because it's not your talent. God can take it away from you tomorrow. Time, we talked about time last week. How do we invest our time? How are you using your time? Your treasure, what do you do with your money? How do you spend your money? Church, it all belongs to God. Because Matthew 25, 21, this is what I want to hear when I hit hit heaven's doorstep. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Can you imagine those words? Church, some of you want so much, and I keep telling you all the time, be faithful in the little that God has given you. But we're never satisfied with that. Oh, God, give me more. Oh, God, give me more. I want more responsibility. I want this. I want that. I want to be a leader. I want to do this. You don't understand the cost of all those things. It's so important, church, that you grasp this. Whatever God has given you this morning, whatever time, talent, and treasure God has given you, take it and cultivate it. Honor God with it. Honor him, and God will reward you. And he'll take what little you have, and he will grow it. He will grow it. I'm telling you, I've taken on so much over the last month. I I bit off more than I could chew. I really did. I took on another responsibility, and I was like, ah, should I really do this? But I really felt compelled in my heart to do it. And I was like, God, where am I going to find the time to do it? You know what? He made the time. Now, it may not be the time the way I want it, but I've got, I have time to do what I have to do. All of us do. That's an excuse. 
I don't have time means I don't want to. And that's not the Lord. Take what you have and let God cultivate it. And if you do, you will hear those words, enter into the joy of your master. And Father, those are the words that we all long to hear. The voice of our master, our sweet Jesus. Welcoming him, welcome him, yeah. Opening his arms to us and saying, welcome home. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you love us and care for us so much. Thank you that you entrust us with your kingdom. That all that we have in our hands, Lord, is only because you have given it to us to grow and cultivate to your glory and honor. I pray for those this morning who are sick and hurting, just desperately need your touch, God. I pray that wherever they're at, that you will remind them that you're there that they will experience your love, that they'll hear your sweet voice, and that you'll bring comfort and peace to their hearts. I pray, Father, you'd give us what we need today and every day as we go through this week. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And all the saints said, amen, amen. amen.